Why don't I start by telling you how this Paraquat journey began? Um, it actually came from the board member, from a board member of the Parkinson Alliance, who had seen an article about three or four years ago about Paraquat, and he assumed it was banned in the US because it was banned in the EU, for example. And uh, so that prompted us to start looking into it. Um, Brittany dug deep uh, into the research to put the argument together, a scientifically valid and scientifically based argument together as to why paraquat should be banned uh, and the linkages to Parkinson's, uh, it's linked to other diseases as well. Um, and so this started out not because we came up with it, but because a member of the community uh, came up with it. And I put that out there because we, um, well, we can do our jobs. It's a lot easier to do our jobs if we know from all of you what issues are actually relevant to people with Parkinson's and their caregivers and families. Um, and so that led to us uh, developing a, uh, or Brittany putting together a, a document from the UPAC, the Unified Parkinson's Advocacy Council, made up of about you now 23 or 24 different PD organizations around the country. Um, urging the EPA to ban Paraquat. Um, and then we set up a change.org petition that now I think has over 118,000 signatures urging the EPA to ban it. We submitted that when it was uh, about 107,000. Um, and change.org said that they rarely get petitions that hit over 100,000. Um, so we, that's how we've been building up the momentum on this. Uh, unfortunately, the EPA, what, two weeks ago, decided to re-register the chemical. And so um, it is going to continue its usage in the United States, even though it's been banned now in, I think, 32 countries, most recently Thailand, um, China, which uh, it's a Chinese company that owns Paraquat. Um, they, they have banned it as well. So that's kind of a big picture overview, um, but I'm going to turn it over to Brittany to fill in some details. Ted gave a really good um, overview of, of what we've been doing in the past. Um, it is banned in a lot of a lot of countries, and yeah, the Ch China is the big one because China owns, so it's manufactured and um, and distributed out of the European Union um, by a company called Syngenta. So Paraquat is kind of a generic term it's like the chemical term and there are a number of brand names so like glyphosate is roundup um but there's other names for it um or kleenex is tissue you know i mean it's it's uh, paraquat is sort of the, the the chemical and then there are a variety of companies that um produce and sell it but the main one is this syngenta and they are owned they just got acquired by chem china and paraquat is banned in in both the entire European Union, um, although it is allowed to be exported as it is to America um, and in China as, as well. And there are a number of things wrong um, that, uh, that, you know, it's, uh, it does cause Parkinson's disease. It's also very toxic. It also causes a variety of cancers. It's, it, we do focus on the Parkinson's angle, but there are a lot of reasons to, um, to ban the chemical. Uh, so it's, it was pretty disappointing when two weeks ago, um, the EPA sort of looked at all the evidence and then said, that's lovely, but we're still going to allow it to be sold um, in the United States. There are a number of restrictions um, for its use. Um, I would argue, we have been arguing that they are not strict enough. Um, some of the restrictions include protective equipment and you can't just buy it on the street. Like you can like a Roundup for, to spray in your own garden. It is more restricted than that, but um, it is so terribly toxic, both to our brains and to the rest of our bodies, frankly. Um, it's really good at killing cells, uh, which is why it kills weeds. Um, that it just should not be sold anywhere, honestly, but we're focusing on the United States. Um, so Ted gave a, a really good overview of where we've been. As far as where we're going, um, 
there are a couple of bills, you know, federal bills that are hanging out there for at least a couple more months before they uh, die, as all bills do um, when there's a new Congress. Um, one of those bills is a very specific paraquat ban bill um, that we wrote with um, Nadia Velasquez uh, out of New York. And then um, another one is a much bigger pesticide um, reform bill. It bans a number of pesticides and, and asks the EPA to look at uh, its scientific review and a, a number of other things. And that is um, currently being pushed by um, Nagus and uh, in the House and uh, Udall in the Senate, um, who is retiring. So we will need to find additional um, uh, champions to um, reintroduce that bill come 2021, which is a place where the, the PD Avengers could be, could be helpful to help us educate members of Congress about the importance of this and help us um, you know, find that next champion and, and hopefully that next dozen champions. Um, and then also we are working on getting a ban in California because um, California is at the forefront of uh, this kind of thing. They have banned other chemicals in the past that other states and the federal government have not. And it is one of those things where if we could get it banned in one state, you could take that victory and sort of translate it. One, translate the strategy to other states and two, um, you know, use the evidence that, well, you don't, you don't wanna have something California that won't let its people have um, that kind of thing. So that's where we're going in the new year. Um, and we're just gonna keep pushing on this. And so having the, um, the PD Avengers uh, on board and educating the public and members of Congress about how concerning this is to, to them um, will really amplify our voice. Um, in addition to if we were to do another petition or something like that, which, which we might uh, in the new year to um, more targeted at, at Congress or at a state as opposed to EPA because EPA has done its work and is not going to look at this again unless it is forced to uh, for quite a long time, ten, at least 10 years, probably more like 15. Um, but I think that's, that's kind of the overview and we're happy to answer questions. Let me just fire a couple at you real quick. Uh, you know, I, I know that paraquat, a, a teaspoon of paraquat will kill a human being. How, how much is used in the United States each year and how is it used? It is um, among the most commonly used pesticide. Um, it is used because, um, this is getting a little nerdy, but the, um, the Roundup that I keep mentioning glyphosate, which is, which is the most commonly used pesticide in probably the world at this point, um, there are plants that are becoming resistant to it. Corn is, you know, there's ready, there's Roundup ready corn, but there's also corn that's becoming resistant to, uh, or the, um, sorry, weeds are becoming resistant to um, the Roundup and they, it isn't working anymore. And Paraquat has been uh, sold and sort of marketed as an alternative to some of these um, chemicals that are uh, one, not strong enough and not as toxic um, in some cases and two, you know, not killing the weeds. And it's always an arms race with this stuff. At some point there will be Paraquat resistant crops and weeds. Um, does that, this is just evolution. Um, of, of bugs and, and that kind of thing. But um, as it stands, the incident, the um, poundage put on acres per year is going up uh, primarily because of this successful marketing. And I could get you exact numbers, but it's, it's sprayed all over the country a lot um, on cotton and then citrus groves. Um, it doesn't infiltrate bark. Um, it kills green matter. And so it, it works very well you can kind of just spray it indiscriminately on like an apple tree, you know, around apple trees and it won't kill the apple tree. Um, but it'll kill everything around it. That's pleasant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what kind of reaction have you guys been getting from the bills that are uh, currently uh, sitting somewhere in Washington? We, it, it's mixed, um, like all things um, nowadays. Um, it's starting to be kind of political. 
Um, you know, you wouldn't think health would be political, but um, there, there's some substantial pushback from, um, I, I guess I would say, uh, bo both the, um, the growers, the people growing um, trees and, and that kind of thing who just want the yields. Um, it's, it's a little bit sad because I, you know, they're putting their immediate profits over future health. Um, but, you know, in, in some ways I, uh, am sympathetic to that. If you're looking at maybe getting cancer or Parkinson's in 10 years, but right now you could get twice the number of oranges per acre, you know, why, why wouldn't you do that? So there has been substantial pushback from industry types. Um, and so it's become sort of more of a Democrat friendly issue um, with Republicans pushing back saying, you know, we need to allow all sorts of things to allow um, people to make money and to, to push industry forward. Um, so it's, it, it, it it depends. We, we get a lot of people really excited and then a lot of people saying, um, you know, we need to give every opportunity to, to our farmers out there. Um, the farm worker groups are on board with us as they tend to be um, poorer and my, you know, the migrant farm worker types as opposed to the big industry um, growers, I guess, for lack of a better term. Has there been any discussion about uh, supplementing the farmers? Uh, so th they've done that in the past for them not to grow stuff. Um, so because, you know, corn or whatever. So um, that could be an alternative, like stop using that. We'll, we'll, and the government can subsidize you for your missing crops. Yeah, and that's a plan. So it's the, the kind of weird side step of this is that my husband is, um, I, works in agriculture. Um, and so he's helped us uh, as a unpaid uh, advisor um, think through that kind of, those kinds of opportunities. So one, one thing you can do is um, give people alternatives um, and we don't promote other pesticides because we don't know what impact those could have. Um, but things like integrated pest, pest management, which is an organic type of um, method, and um, and then or you know organic um, pesticides, and um, you know not tilling your land. There's a bunch of kind of nerdy stuff that you can do to reduce the poundage of pesticides that you have to apply onto crops. Um, and then also exactly what you just said, um, education, and then just straight up paying people for, okay, so you're gonna reduce your yield by 20%, you know, here's 20% of what your crop, you know, here's an additional 20% check. Um, and there are uh, programs in place that will, uh, they have the capacity to do stuff like that. And they will do stuff like that, not currently for not spraying chemicals, but for other types of um, procedures that people can do, you know, to help save uh, waterways and that kind of thing. So oh, that's, uh, a good idea. You see what prompted us to look at California was that they did exactly that with another chemical <clears throat> um, and uh, put together a fund to help transform um, the practice of farming in California. I mean, ultimately, this is such a bigger issue than one chemical. And as Brittany pointed out, you know, these um, crops uh, or the weeds and things like that and bugs become resistant to, you know, different chemicals. And um, so really it's about a transformation of how we farm and that's going to take time. And that's why, you know, even though there's a risk of people getting PD, the farmers, you know, still want it. Um, and the EPA, you know, to their credit has increasingly put restrictions on, but as Brittany said, we think that they're not, not um, strong enough. And even though we've been working on this for what, three plus years, you know, we're just at the beginning of it because we know that change like what we're talking about is going to take um, take some significant time. Have you, have you done any work in collaborating with the EU in, in maybe trying to get them to stop <laughs> shipping it over? <laughs> well, can I yeah. ask that the other the other perspective? Have we done any work with the, or how are we getting on with the investment companies in terms of uh, ethical investing and uh, 
exactly the same process that when uh, that uh, they've gone through on, on coal and uh, coal manufacture. So we haven't with investors um, uh, uh, specifically, but um, as far as working with the EU, we um, we reached out to Syngenta. Um, I had I have, happened to have a contact there, um, a, a personal friend, and she a little bit was like, you know, I I'm I'm not going to respond to this. I mean, she told me an offline, but because um, the hope was that we could say, hey, you know, you could. Let's help us help you help us. Um, and you could look really good here if you um, on your own started phasing it out. Um, you know, saying, oh, you care so very much about, um, you know, people's health and, and, and the well-being of people. Uh, they decided to not take that route um, and instead put up a website that uh, claims to debunk some of the misconceptions that are actually scientific fact um, out there. Um, and and I think if you go to paraquat.com, it's actually owned by Syngenta and they have a, a, a bunch of articles um, and basically just say, oh no, this is fine. <laughs> um, so that didn't work, but as far as uh, working with like the EU government, um, that would be something to do down the, down the path. I would encourage us to think about the investment companies as well. I mean, having given that, that's where my career comes from. And uh, the pressure on investment houses around ethical investment screening criteria is, is really significant. And if, you know, if it, if it then becomes a, and on a screen out to the parent company, that's that can have quite an impact. Is Chem China a state owned? Yes. Yeah, so it's owned by the Chinese government. It's, owned, it's entirely, yeah. Yeah, yeah which okay. does make it a little bit more challenging. And also, particularly given the territories in which um, uh, in the Chinese government have massive investment projects. And I'm, I'm thinking of Ethiopia just off the top of my head and, and sort of the infrastructure projects there that that therefore they've got all the connections and the infrastructure to be able to keep using um, chemicals very broadly in the territories where they have these huge investments. So it is, it's a very big issue. And I mean, Ted, Brittany, how can we best help you to get this over the line? Sorry, Ellen, just to come back on that. That's a very fair comment, but I think the investment side, you can look at the supply chain yeah, because that was okay. exactly the thing with coal, fried, uh, coal, coal plants. So I think you're right, China, you know, it makes it very difficult, but at least we can look at the supply chains with the investment houses. And it's one of those things where I guess I, I don't, you, you know much more than I do about, about the investing and, and that kind of thing. Um, because the Chinese government owns ChemChina, which owns Syngenta, but if, if you can own stock in Syngenta independently, that could be a they want to be profitable. I mean, I, I think there's still mm. um, been, been to pressures of, of economic pressures and, and that kind of thing. But yeah, I would. Uh, Brittany, at one point, didn't you look to see how much um, this product meant to Syngenta in terms of their overall revenue stream? Yes. And they do. Syngenta is, uh, sells both seed and a variety of crop protectors. Um, and crop protector is a blanket term that includes um, pesticides, but is also a number of other things, um, you know, like nets and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's not a huge percentage of their revenue. As best I could tell, you know, that stuff is trade secrets technically. Um, but as best as I could tell, they, you know, they have their, um, their reports out to, to the board uh, that you can get a hold of. And um, it couldn't possibly be a huge percentage just because they make so much money and you can see how much is sold and, and applied. So, um, And I raised that because it highlights the fact that if there's enough public pressure you know, in a given country or throughout the world, you know, eventually it can become, um, I think as Gary was referring to with investors, but it could become more of a headache than it's worth um, for the, for Chem China to keep it on the market. Um, That's true. Although I will say that um, we are one of their biggest clients. So they're gonna, for a lot of things, but uh, specifically for Paraquat. So they're going to, um, be loath to volunteer to do much voluntarily 
since if not for the US, I don't think there is much of a market at all for this uh, chemical. So I guess it would, you know, I can't predict what they would say in their board meetings. <laughs> Maybe you're right. It would be, oh, sure, let's just dump this. Um, but also it could be like, well, if we don't fight hard in the US, we've lost our whole market. It's also legal still in Canada for some companies, right? Yeah, for some, for I think very limited uses, but. Okay. Uh, and then back to Helen's question, what can we do to help push this over the line? Um, Ted might have some ideas. I think, uh, you know, a push in California, you know, you, I, I like your emails where you say uh, PDA vendors mobilize and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. And, and it's, um, I think you, you have a lot of uh, people and, and a, a good um, broad, uh, you know, network. Um, so we're just getting started in California. Um, if there was a storm, storm the, I don't know if they have a hill there. I, I think of everything as, as federal, but the st storm, the Sacramento um, type of <laughs> type of project uh, when once that um, is underway, I could see um, that really moving the needle in California, just given state. Uh, Ted has examples about um, how quickly things can work at the state level when they are glacially slow at the federal level. Um, so this feels like something that could be done in a short, shorter amount of time than we've already been pushing on the federal. Um, and then, yeah, just mobilizing and, and getting the word out and um, pre putting pressure on members of Congress, um, mostly because they, as we saw a number of years ago with um, various uh, Affordable Care Act provisions and stuff that just people stormed the hill and they could not be ignored. And I think we're at the stage where we need to have enough numbers and enough screaming and squeaking wheels that uh, we can't be ignored. Yeah, if I, I'll just uh, uh, add to that. Um, the, the more comprehensive bill that bans uh, a lot more pesticides. And I think it also creates like an emergency review of pesticides that are still used in the US but are not used in the EU. <clears throat> um, if we could get that bill enacted, that could be a game changer, um, you know, in, in a real way. Uh, it's gonna be heavily opposed, obviously. Um, I think the incoming administration will be more favorable, obviously. Uh, because, for example, when Thailand decided to ban Paraquat, the Trump administration pressured them to undo their ban. Um, and so the Biden administration will be more favorable on it. Uh, but it does take, um, well, one example, we, we, it took us 10 years to get a simple surveillance system enacted in the United States for Parkinson's. Um, and then it took us two more years to get the funding for it. Um, whereas at the state level, because well, one, they have to have balanced budgets and, and they actually, you know, have deadlines that they meet and things like that. You, you can get done in, you know, four months at a state level, what might take 15 years at the federal level. And so the California element, um, well, for example, they recently banned, um, a chemical that I don't remember the details. <laughs> well, that one, but no, this session they banned um, they banned a chemical that was dangerous to mountain wolves, and they also banned use of certain chemicals in cosmetics. And so, you know, they have an appetite for this type of thing. Um, so we think that, and a governor and an EPA that is sympathetic. So I think if we could uh, make headway in California, which is what the fifth largest economy in the world and the largest state in the United States, um, that could really start a, um, a positive impact uh, to get other states to do it. Now, that being said, there are some states that unfortunately, because of how polarized this country has become, everything becomes a democratic issue or a Republican issue. Um, and there, But there are gonna be Democrats from farm states that are not going to support a ban, for example, because of how critical it is to their economy. Um, and that's where the, the bigger approach of how do we change how people farm. And it's not just because of Paraquat, it's going to be, this is going to be a challenge, you know, for, from a food perspective um, in the future. And, and I do think for uh, it does 
lend itself to international cooperation. Um, you know, World Health Organization, the EU, um, I, I think uh, these are going to be increasingly large issues. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's very much a global, uh, you know, uh, climate change. And there's there are other pressures on the food system that we're going to need to address. And in, and in some ways, unfortunately, um, some of these issues will be addressed with will need to be addressed with or could be addressed with more and stronger pesticides. I mean, as the, the planet warms, there's it's there's a longer bug season, <laughs> you know, and, and that kind of thing. So this is going to be a challenge um, into the into the future for sure. Well, as if you've um, you've mentioned this, but how long is the land tainted uh, once it's been um, had the paraquat onto it? How long will it take before it can be clean, so to speak? I, I didn't hear you. How long is it in the, like, is it in the soil? How, you mean? how many will, will, like, will the paraquat stay in the land? So that it's, oh, oh. You know, um, land. One of the advantages of it actually that is that it, it goes fairly inert fairly quickly in the soil. Um, we're not talking, I mean, it's not minutes, it's it's days or weeks, but it's mm -hmm. not years. There, there are some other chemicals where it's, uh, gets into the water supply and, and can be um, terribly toxic to to people um, and animals for you know months and months. Um, this can get into the water supply, but it goes it's it's not too bad. the The way it's um, brought home is typically on clothing because it's a pow it's a powder and a liquid. So if it gets on your clothing and you bring that home, um, as opposed to getting into the you know getting into the water supply, if that's if that's sort of what you're what asking. I'm just wondering, because paraquat seems to be a trigger for a variety of pathologies, have we um, looked at partnering with other organizations, health organizations like the Cancer S Society and that sort of thing? In order yes, to draw yes. Under? Yeah, I'm working with um, uh, uh, the Lung Association on, on a number of issues, including, including this one, a number of environmental groups that have a health bent. Um, when we, uh, the, the, I'm trying to think the bladder cancer folks <laughs> are fairly involved with me, um, breast, the breast cancer, something Alliance, which is actually in California. Um, so yes, no, we, we definitely, we don't do anything not in coalition, um, in DC, but certainly, um, it to amplify the, um, you know, we, uh, Ted and I represent Parkinson's patients, and that is our, our number one and, and, and main concern. But if, for this one, our goal is to just get it out of the food system. And so, you know, we're willing to work with whoever is, <laughs> wants to work with us on that. So, yes. Gary. One of the other groups I should mention, and I can't believe Brittany has it. Uh, the Environmental Working Group, which is a national organization, but it also works at the state level. Um, so they'd be an organization to maybe look at, um, uh, they've indicated that they are going to work with us on trying to get a California ban. Mm -hmm. um, and NRDC, the NRDC and the, um, there's a wildlife group that is, that actually pivots at this and looks at it more from the bee angle, the, the pollinator angle um, and um, different species um, and that kind of thing. But there's, there's that angle as well as that, um, pesticides kill both pollinators and endangered species. So I've been working with some animal groups, although you make the strangest friends. <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, sorry, I know this is back to a similar theme, but if we talk to the crop insurance companies, because this is quite a concentrated market, and presumably once the data starts to show things, that will be a, a, a challenge for them as well. We um, have not. No, um, not the crop insurance. Um, okay, well, I, I, I have some, maybe we should talk out, outside of this. Absolutely, yeah, we, sure. It's, it seems so mysterious and dark, Gary. That's great. I love it. Um, well, you know, the, what Gary's getting at, though, is the liability. There are right. many lawsuits and, and law firms farming for patients, uh, which we, we don't get involved in that. Um, but ultimately, the liability aspect um, and these insurance, the, the people who insure uh, ChemChina or other producers of it, um, the liability aspect could change their view. 
Yeah, sure. and um, I, I was going to kind of note this at the end because, like Ted said, we aren't we don't get involved. But there are a number of I know of at least three or four kind of you know have you been diagnosed with mesothelioma kind of mm. um, uh, personal injury type uh, cases um, that are uh, specific to paraquat. Um, they've reached out to me to try to find Parkinson's patients who, or to essentially to try to find plaintiffs, Parkinson's patients who believe that they um, develop Parkinson's due to exposure to paraquat. And um, we aren't, we're friendly to every, we're nice to everyone. Um, so I send them, um, you know, our comments and, and, and the science and, and that kind of thing. And um, if anybody were to come to us with that kind of story, we would let them know that there are cases out there and encourage them to look for them themselves. But there are a number of, of cases um, sort of brewing in a number of states as well, which again, were, would be great if that um, put enough financial pressure on uh, the companies to uh, eliminate the chemical. I don't particularly care how it gets done, but we uh, as of yet have not gotten involved in any of those cases. Looks like Mark's got his hand up. Mark, then um, Tim. Uh, you referred a minute ago to climate change, and I think that's actually extremely pertinent because, uh, and with the an eye on COP26, which will be held next year in Glasgow, um, there is increasing awareness in the climate change world that food production is one of the key factors contributing to climate change. Transport, for example, flying beans from Latin America to Europe and things like that. Uh, but also the, um, the, the use of chemicals and the, the, the way the land is basically eroded and ripped from its longevity, from its sustainability. So I wonder if it's worth looking at a, a link up with COP26 in some form, because that could really also support the case to get rid of paraquat. Do you have any information about them that you could share or have Larry send along? Yeah, just send it to me, Mark, and I'll pass it along to Ted. I, I'll pass it. Um, Tim. No question. Just scratching my ear. Oh, <laughs> uh, but that's that's great. Uh, hello, Rochelle. Hi there. Um, thanks very much for the the update about it. Um, I saw, just had a couple of questions. Um, yeah, I was wondering about the WHO, um, because they now. Um, Neurological diseases is classified as the fifth MCD along with mental health. So they seem to be kind of beginning to focus more on, on the neurological slow, but surely. Um, and obviously in terms of, you know, Parkinson's being the, the fastest growing neurological condi condition, um, it definitely sounds logical to, to, to sort of try and influence there. But I was just wondering in terms of why is it that in the EU it's banned? So what is the, you know, the, the quality of evidence here versus in the states is the same what is the difference um is the other question and this was the other question i had was um in terms of you know i don't have in-depth knowledge of uh, paraquat but does it get into the food chain and i suppose in terms of you know uh, getting pd avengers sort of behind the messaging i think people identify with things that you know that are going to impact their health or their kids and you know so in terms of the messaging to the, the populace, um, you know, is, is there a threat around that uh, to people in terms of getting into the food chain? And I suppose in terms of export from the States, food from the States outwards to other countries, I, I don't know what the, if there is any impact there. Um, so those are the kind of, some of the questions I, I had. Well, that's okay. one of the beauties I of have... this uh, for the company is that it doesn't stick on the food. The food is fine. Um, cause initially when I heard about this, um, that was my, uh, immediate thought, uh, Brittany. Yeah. So to, to answer, um, well, I'll, yeah, I'll take your questions in, in the opposite. Yeah, it, it is not, um, I've, I've had to admit to a number of staffers that you, you and I, if you are not applying this chemical are, are probably not going to get Parkinson's from Paraquat. It does go fairly inert quickly in the soil and it does, it doesn't get into the food system. Uh, there are, there is a possibility of some residue and that kind of thing, but that would be more um, of a toxic kind of ingestion problem rather than um, just the, the pathology of how this, how it gets into your, 
it, it, you, it probably goes in through your nose and then it kills some cells up in, um, in your frontal cortex and, and then uh, causes some degradation and that I could get into that would take the rest of the call. Um, so, so unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you want to say it, fortunately, I guess I, I should say for our health, it, it doesn't um, get into the, uh, the food system in, um, and especially for export. And then as far as why it's banned in the EU and not in the United States, very simple answer uh, for that one. It is called the precautionary principle which is applied in the EU and in a number of other countries and is not applied in the United States. And by precautionary principle, what I say, it's how they come at the evidence. So in the EU, you have to have affirmative evidence of safety. Um, if there's no evidence, the default is that something won't be uh, allowed. And that's the same in, in uh, cosmetics and hair dye and, um, you know, as an aside, I only buy hair dye that's approved in the EU because of this, because of this exact thing. Um, all chemicals, there has to be affirmative evidence of, um, of safety. Um, in the United States, there has to be affirmative evidence of um, not safety or of, of toxicity. Um, and so if, if there is no evidence of, of it being very toxic in the United States, our default would be to approve. So we have a very approve forward type of um, philosophy behind um, our chemical reviews. And then the EU, they have a very precautionary um, philosophy behind how they review chemicals. Um, the end result is functionally, like I said, with the hair dye and that kind of thing, so I'm going gray, I'm getting older, um, is that there are far more chemicals approved for use in the United States than there are in the EU because of this kind of gray area where there's, uh, where the evidence is, can be argued either way, we would default to approving and they would default to banning. Um, so that's probably the simplest way. I mean, and then you could go into the politics and the, you know, there's a, there's a lot of other squishy um, reasons, but uh, that's, that's kind of the big philosophy reason. You know, when people are spraying, you know, is it spraying paraquat or you hear by people in terms of glyco glycophosphates here in Ireland? Uh, I've seen conversations on Twitter about, you know, the spraying and basically affecting people, not just the farmers, but, you know, the lands, you know, around. Is that the same for paraquat in terms of, you know, or is it literally just the people who are spraying it? Are you using so there, it part of the risk? There is some drift. There's definitely, in, with all chemicals and all things, there's some, what we call drift, which is uh, the chemical being carried by the air or the water nearby, or just, um, you know, the winds and that kind of thing. So there is some of that. Um, from what we can tell from the studies, mostly done in central California, um, it is primarily the actual appliers of the chemical, so the farm worker that's out there spraying it, but also their families, and they believe the mechanism for, I quote unquote, bringing it home is um, that it gets on their clothing. Um, and then there is some sort of minimal drift, but um, it, it, this is a little bit of a hard uh, thing to pare down as well, because um, the studies in Central California have found that um, if you live within you know, a hundred, uh, or not a hundred miles, that would be very far, but uh, like a mile of where this is sprayed, you're at a much higher risk of getting Parkinson's. Um, but it's, you know, it's a little bit uh, conflated variables there. Is it because it's drifting? Is it because these people also tend to be applying it? Is it, you know, there's a number of different kind of conflated variables there. Um, but there's definitely some, uh, some of it moving around. It, it, sure. Is that the studies of uh, Dr. Bronstein and Dr. Ritz? Yeah, Beate Ritz um, yep. and then Carly Tanner as well. Okay. Yeah, I suppose it, one of the things uh, that I noticed when I, we posted it on our PG Avengers Facebook, it just a couple of people, I posted on a few different pages and a couple of people kind of came back and said, oh, that only affects farmers. Or I don't, you know, it was, it was interesting in terms of the, you know, because it didn't affect them. Um, so I just kind of wonder how we change that dialogue in terms of, you know, that it's not just them. It could be within a, do you know? Uh, yeah. How do we make people care about it? Yeah. <laughs> you mean people don't care about uh, other, other people? Um, 
yeah, that we can't quite use the food, you know, the, the food residue thing, um, like I mentioned, but um, definitely if you live in a rural area, you are at a higher risk of getting Parkinson's disease. And that is as best we can tell because of exposure to uh, pesticides. Cat, Kat's uh, family was involved in that Central uh, California study. Can you tell us about it, Kat? Yeah, my, so my dad had PD and um, I was born and raised right in the Central Valley in Merced County. <clears throat> and they, the reason California, I think, was used was because they are the only state that requires registration of all of the pesticides that are sprayed. So we own 50 acres of cotton, which we sublet but there were lots of crop dusting. And so, and that was a really fun thing as kids, right? To go out and watch the crop dusters in our bathing suits and wading pools. Um, and of note, we weren't farmers. My dad was a dentist and was the mayor, but we lived out in the country and drove into town. And, um, but they followed his progression and, and, and that, that, that data was presented at the 2016 WPC in Portland <clears throat> at one of the plenary sessions. And I forget the name of the study, probably because I have Parkinson's, but maybe not. But um, <laughs> anyway, they, they actually contacted me um, because my dad told them that I was diagnosed. Now I live in Oregon now, but have a broad network down there and went to school with actually a lot of people that are farming, dairy farmers and um, <clears throat> they're doing a lot of sweet potato and almonds and, and those things now in the central Valley. Um, but it's, it's interesting to follow. Um, and of note, my brother starting to show some symptoms of Parkinson's disease, um, has not been evaluated yet, but that's a pretty significant history, but, but I had young, young onset. My dad had later onset. Now, do you, do you attribute yours to the uh, chemicals? Uh, um, I'm not sure. I, I think there were, there's confounding uh, variables. And, and as a clinician, I, 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 ha I have to see the evidence. Um, but yeah, I, we don't have the, the genetic, any of the genes that we can test for that show the familial links. Um, so uh, something else caused it, whether it's a, you know, a predisposition and a genetic, you know, a viral trigger or who knows, you know. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that you were a dairy, you were on a dairy farm because um, in the, I want to say the 80s, there was a big controversy in Hawaii um, with the dairy farmers. They, the milk supply in Hawaii was showing really high levels of this hect hectophore, I can't remember the name of it, but it, it's not paraquat, but it was a different pesticide. I think it was called hectophore epoxinide, maybe. Um, that was a pesticide that was used all over the pineapple plantations. And the cows were wandering over and eating, you know, as they do, because pineapples are yummy, uh, you know, eating some of the, the greenery and then the grass and that kind of thing. And it was getting into their milk. And um, they were finding this chemical in the milk supply. And it was, um, it caused a huge controversy and was very strongly associated with an increase uh, Parkinson's incidence in that general area of Hawaii. Um, I think it was in the, I want to say it was like eight, in the, you know, 1980 to 1985, that kind of range. So that's, that's interesting that you um, have that connection in, in California. Yeah. And, and I'm sure it's other places. It's just that it hasn't been studied and there aren't good records of, of what companies were using to spray their crops with. So if I could jump in real quick on that. Um, yeah, that that's the other reason California is so important. Uh, the, uh, we've got a, a Parkinson's disease registry up and running there now. Um, so that's three, year, three years ago is when they started that. And one of the reasons we pushed so hard for that <clears throat> was the potential research that can happen when you overlay the pesticide registry with the, with the Parkinson's registry. Now that, unfortunately, you know, you live in a different state now. So I think that would be a, a longer term um, aspect of that registry or of the research community is how do we find former Californians that may have been exposed. Um, but yeah, so that is also part of our argument with California EPA why, you know, that, that state is ripe for uh, taking action on this. Um, I have to actually hop off on another call, but uh, back to Helen's question about what people can do. 
Um, I mean, this is a good first step, obviously, learning more about it. Um, but, uh, you know, our focus at this point is in the U.S. and in California, with California probably being more ripe than the United States. <clears throat> but oftentimes what happens here is, uh, is uh, well, states are the incubators, and oftentimes what states do, the federal government will mimic uh, down the road. Um, I would encourage people, you know, make sure you're signed up for our action alerts. Uh, make sure, uh, you know, if you're in another country and you're not sure about the process there, you know, go to whatever the, the version of the EPA is to learn more. Um, I think educate lawmakers. And even if you're in a country where it's banned, I think it's okay to educate those lawmakers and policymakers to say, hey, did you know, um, you know, in the United States and many other countries or the pressure point with China, you know, the Chinese government owns this company that, you know, has this horribly dangerous chemical. Um, and, and for the, the other point to be made um, is if we, we believe that Paraquat is a trigger for Parkinson's so far as we know. And so if we eliminate Paraquat, we eliminate that trigger. And they're actually, and Brittany, probably has a list that you can rattle off. There, there are many other chemicals, you know, rotenone, uh, heavy metals, many other areas that are also possible triggers. So I know you're all familiar with the book that, uh, you know, Ray and, and others wrote um, about ending Parkinson's, but that is one piece of it where if we find the triggers and we eliminate the triggers, you at least um, eliminate that element of Parkinson's. It's more complex than that, but you know that is one way. Well, that's great, Ted and, and Brittany. Thank you so much for your time and for for uh, taking the, some time to educate us on it. And we're here when you need us. Uh, we'll we'll get started. Uh, we're going to probably form a committee that's going to focus on Paraquat, and then I'll introduce them to you guys, and then you can tell us to go, and we'll go. <laughs> that would be that would be amazing. I love having an army behind. Yes, the Paraquat army. Yes. Um, many other chemicals, you know, rotenone, uh, heavy metals, many other areas that are also possible triggers. So I know you're all familiar with the book that, uh, you know, Ray and, and others wrote um, about ending Parkinson's. But that is one piece of it where if we find the triggers and we eliminate the triggers, you at least um, eliminate that element of Parkinson's. It's more complex than that. But, you know, that is one way we can do it. Yeah, well, that's great, Ted and, and Brittany. Thank you so much for your time and for for uh, taking the, some time to educate us on it. And we're here when you need us. Uh, we'll we'll get started. Uh, we're going to probably form a committee that's going to focus on Paraquat, and then I'll introduce them to you guys, and then you can tell us to go, and we'll go. <laughs> that would be that would be amazing. I love having an army behind. Yes, the Paraquat army. Yes. Um, <laughs> I know Ted has to go. I'm I can stay on, and also I'm just happy to answer any other questions if people want to email me, um, and I can do uh, calls individually, especially with people in Ireland, and can tell me how the weather's over there. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany, what is your email? Thank, it thank is you. uh, thanks, Ted. Oh, Ted. Uh, oh. It is be like boy, and then Meyer M E Y E R at Michael J Fox, kind of all all together M I C H A E L jfox.org. Uh, Great. Brittany, I think you're free to go. Thank you so much okay. for your time. Thanks for what you're Thank doing. You. Yes, and I am, I'm super excited to, um, to hear about the work you guys are doing otherwise with your newsletter and uh, yeah, to get an army going. Mm -hmm.